a lot has been discussed about uh, the Supreme Court decisions, and particularly uh, the immunity case, uh, uh, the the immunity case uh, yesterday. And uh, the immunity case is is problematic because it retains a certain ambiguity that I think people are struggling to uh, to figure out. Uh, it basically creates three categories of um, of three categories of uh, presidential actions, of actions of a president, and, and treats them differently. One is kind of core functions of the president as president for which the president has immunity. And, and uh, to give you a sense of some of the challenges here is one of those is pardons, right? Presidential pardons. It's in the Constitution. Presidents can pardon people. But then if he's immune for the presidential pardon, what if he gets bribed in order to pardon somebody? Is it could be prosecuted for that? Uh, would that constitute a, um, a, a, um, a presidential action that is that it, that is uh, gets full immunity? And and the fascinating thing is, you can poll uh, constitutional uh, or, or Supreme Court experts right now and and ask them whether the uh, the the Supreme Court decision yesterday. Uh, constitutes uh, bribery. Does does it give one hundred percent immunity for bribery? Does it not? And they don't know. And 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 that should be pretty clear. It should be pretty clear. Um, uh, pretty clear. You know, once the Supreme Court decides these things, it should be pretty clear where it falls. The the middle ground is um, the middle. There's a middle ground. A presidential action. But uh, but where you know you'd have to decide if the particular conduct was right uh, as part of his uh, role as president was it essential for that? So here there's ambiguity. You'd actually have to do a finding of fact uh, and separate out private activity from from his role as president. Figure that out exactly, and and that's that's the most ambiguous, and that would be left to the courts uh, to decide. And then the third is the president acting as a private agent, as a private citizen, and there they have no immunity at all. And again, that middle ground is the most difficult part of uh, uh, of all of it. And again, uh, uh, the scholars are out there, and they can't figure out exactly what constitute what and how how this would be interpreted. And the courts are going to have to play this out, and this creates uh, enormous confusion. If if the president, for example, assigns a, t a, a, a SEAL Team Six to go kill a political opponent, is that part of his presidential? Is that part of his presidential function as commander in chief? Uh, but he's doing it for maybe some other motive that isn't related to the good of the country, and therefore. Uh, is it now a private action, or is it something in between, and how, how should the courts... Anyway, lots of ambiguity, lots of challenges, and it's going to be interesting to see how, in the end, uh, the courts resolve it. In the meantime, what this means primarily for Trump is uh, a delay, uh, we said this yesterday, a massive delay in uh, the various court cases against him, which basically will probably get him off the hook, even though he shouldn't. Uh, now, some of the charges against Trump are pretty clearly, what seems, according to the Supreme Court at least, pretty clearly private actions. And therefore, uh, lawsuits should be able to go ahead. The criminal prosecution should be able to go ahead. For example, this is just a Barrett in her, uh, in her, I think it was a concurring opinion, she writes, this analysis is unnecessary, that analysis for things that are not clear whether it's official duty or not, right, the, the, the ambiguous middle. This analysis is unnecessary for allegations involving the president's private conduct because the Constitution offers no protection from prosecution of acts taken in private capacity. All right, that's pretty clear. She continues, sorting private from official conduct sometimes will be difficult, but not always. Take the president's alleged attempt to organize alternative slates of electors. This is Trump. In my view, that conduct is private and therefore not entitled to protection. 
The Constitution vests power to appoint presidential electors in the states. And while Congress has a limited role in the process, the president has none. In short, a president has no legal authority and thus no official capacity to influence how the states appoint their electors. I see no plausible argument for barring prosecution of that alleged conduct. So I think that's helpful a little bit to see how she's thinking of this. What are the duties assigned to a president by the Constitution? Does this fall into one of those duties? Uh, if, if it does, then there's this analysis necessary. Uh, but if it doesn't, as in the case of uh, choosing electors, then it's clear-cut personal, and then they're, they're fully, uh, they, they, they can, there's no, as she says, there's no possible argument for barring prosecution. So I think uh, that's where we are, uh, it, it, you know, in this, in this uh, understanding of these cases. I think there's going to be a lot of commentary as we move into the future. I'm sure I'll have something to say about it as I read more about it. Uh, there are a few legal experts that I would like to, uh, to read more about before I, I, you know, I give you uh, uh, more of this. So I, I'll keep dribbling this out in the next few shows. I think this immunity case is going to keep coming back. It's, it's an important one. We'll, we'll get to the free speech one as well in a minute because I think that one's crucial as well. Um, in some ways, you know, both are crucial because the immunity case is crucial for, for political freedom. Uh, you know, the, 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 the danger of this immunity case, if it's interpreted in the wrong way, is that it, it basically shields the president from any prosecution, from any wrongdoing, and thus moves us for, uh, closer to an authoritarian state. Uh, and, uh, and, and we'll see that, of course, the free speech issue is a big issue because free speech is such a big issue. One other small item regarding the immunity is that uh, Trump is going to uh, uh, is going to appeal his hush money uh, case uh, conviction, not case. His hush money conviction. He's going to ask the court to throw it out uh, based on the immunity defense. I think the chances of that actually going through are very small. I mean, this will be the first test of uh, of this uh, of this immunity. I mean, clearly. Uh, paying a uh, paying a porn, a porn uh, uh, star uh, money uh, not to reveal stuff about a sitting president and a candidate. Uh, well, actually, no, he wasn't sitting president. So this is as a candidate has nothing to do with the president's uh, functioning. So I think this will be thrown out. But again, this will be a good test of uh, uh, of the immunity uh, the immunity uh, thing. Uh, the uh, Manhattan District Attorney's Office like didn't oppose this. Guy said, "Go ahead, appeal this," uh, because I think they're pretty confident that this is uh, that this is you know nonsense. To quote to quote the office, um, uh, we believe defendant's arguments to be without merit. We do not oppose his request to leave the file and his putative request to adjourn sentencing pending determination of his motion. So they're not objecting to this. Uh, and they're going to delay the sentencing of Trump uh, for the hush money uh, case uh, uh, until the court decides it. I think nobody's in a hurry. Uh, with regard to this, he, he's not going to go to jail, so nobody really cares about what the outcome of this ultimately is in terms of sentencing. The main thing is they want to be able to call him a felon. I think that's the main thing, uh, the main thing that they, um, that, uh, you know, people who don't like Trump want to be able to do.